electron SBT. So two things. Uh, first, there's a transcript of this talk that is already available online. So you can just go there and read everything in case you want to refresh it in your mind. And second thing you can do as I did, you can clone the repo, you can say SBT demo, and you can run all the same comments, hopefully with the same results. So let me give you an elevator pitch of, of Ref3, which is a library for visualizing data structures. Let's say you have something like a case class person with first name, which is a string, and age, which, which is a, an int. And let's say you have a person called Bob, 42 years old. So this is the pitch. Ref3 is a library that allows you to do this. Okay, so very straightforward, no boilerplate. You just create some case classes or other data structures, as we'll see, and you get this pretty visualization. And there are a few ways you can configure this. So, for example, if you don't like this uh, noisy string with all the cells, you can just say import simple string, and it will just show like this. Uh, you can also configure the field names or whatever, actually. So it's just a matter of importing and implicit. And now it's called name and not first name. So very straightforward. Everything generated automatically, the field names, the caption, and it's ready for, for you to insert it in your documentation or for you to do live demos, which is something I'm doing right now. Uh, another thing, you can use it to explore the data structures and to kind of understand how things work. So let's say we have a list here. And if you look at this list, nothing unusual here. So you have uh, several cells, cell with the number one, cell with the number two, cell with the number three, and an empty list. And let's, let's say I have something like list two, which is uh, list drop one. Uh, so we just removed the head of the list and we added another element there. And if you visualize this, you'll actually see that they're sharing the tail of the list. So this is very cool for you to understand uh, the persistent data structures. Uh, actually, fun fact, if we used, instead of uh, drop and um, cons, if we did something like this, so we used the updated method from the standard collections, the result is actually quite different. It creates an entirely new list. So it doesn't share a part of the list like you would think. Uh, so as I said, you can use this uh, for different purposes, for documentation, live coding, exploration. Uh, one of the features that I really like is the ability to generate animations. Uh, so here's an animation of a queue that I made. And it's just a queue with elements being appended on one side and removed on another side. Uh, yeah. So actually the animations is something that I would like to talk about today uh, since it's my favorite feature and last year I've been giving a talk on uh, data structures and some functional concepts and I realized that while visualizing those things I actually used the same concepts to build visualizations. So I thought we would explore these principles and how you can build this sort of animation using functional programming techniques. Uh, so in order for, that, for us to do that, uh, we should really uh, know how Ref3 actually works. So remember we have this guy Bob here. Uh, it's a person with a uh, name and an age. Uh, and in order to visualize this thing, uh, Ref3 creates an internal data structure which is called surprisingly Ref3. And I know it's a bad name, but actually the previous name for the library was uh, diapers, as diagrams of persistent data structures. <laughs> so it could have been worse. Um, anyway, so the ref tree uh, looks a bit like this. Uh, actually, we can do even better. We can get a ref tree of a ref tree to visualize the ref tree. So if we say render 
Bob, Rep3, and Bob. Oops, uh, I need to do some imports here. <coughs> so the Rep3 looks a bit like this, and it has two main types of nodes. It has a ref, which is a pointer to an object, and it has the name person, which is displayed here. Uh, it also has the ID, which is used to track the same instance of uh, the same instance of the same object, uh, and it has children, which are fields with names. Like here is a field name, and here is the age, and then they point to other refs or vals, which are values that don't point to anything. So 42 in this case is a val. Um, so this is great, but how do we actually get from here? to something that we can draw, like to a picture. Well, what Ref3 does, it actually produces a definition of a graph in a dot language that can be used by a tool called GraphVis to display a graph. Uh, so, you can look at a graph of Bob. It will be something like this, so it has some properties, uh, some nodes. It's not really interesting to read it. Uh, but just for you to have an idea. And finally, we can ask Graphis to produce some sort of image from this, like a PNG, or even better, we can create the vector image, like SVG, and it's just a bunch of accidents. <coughs> so uh, let's think again about our animation use case. So imagine we have this queue with the number one, and we want to animate its transition to a queue with the numbers one and two. Uh, sorry. So this would look like this. Now, what we could do is we could just take these separate images, put them into an animated GIF, and it would be an animation. But it'd be really crappy, right? Because it just jumps. Uh, if we go back to a queue with the number one, I mean, it's, it's not really good enough. So what we really want is we want to insert a lot of intermediate frames between these two frames that would kind of smoothen out the transition. And it's really great that we have SVG because it's a vector format, so we can just move things there by changing the numbers and changing other things. And we basically just need to move all the nodes, move all the edges, uh, change all the shapes of all the edges if they change shape. Uh, we need to interpolate the colors, the line thickness. I think at this point you get that it's not really that simple. And what you really need for this is some sort of principled approach that would be very clear for us to, to build up this sort of interpolation and to understand how it works. And so in the great tradition of functional programming, let's start with a simple abstraction. Uh, so this is an abstraction that I called interpolation. So interpolation of A is basically something that you can give left and the right values of type A, and then you say, I want this point between them, and it just interpolates. And obviously, you can use the same thing uh, to sample the interval between left and right. So you can say, I want five samples between these two values, and it just produces you five samples. Uh, well, the most obvious thing to interpolate is a single number, and I think we should start with that. So let's say uh, we render uh, interpolation double sample from 0 to 10, and we want five samples. So this basically gives you a sec with five numbers. Uh, what we would expect, so it's 0, 2.5, 5, 7.5, and 10. Uh, now let's um, step it up. So imagine we have not a single number, but a point in a 2D space. So a point would be something like point of 10 and 20. Well, point is basically just two numbers, right? So if we could just get in there and interpolate the x-coordinate and get in there and interpolate the y-coordinate, basically we would have a way to interpolate the point. Uh, and to do this, again, we are going to introduce even more abstraction, but it will pay off at the end. Uh, so this, there is this very cool thing that is called lens, which is a particular case of optics. And the lens from type A to type B is something that focuses on a part of a data structure of type A, and it gives you a read-write access to that part. So let's create some lenses and see how they work. 
let's say, for example, x will be again lens. And I'm here I'm using the monocle library, which is very cool. It has lenses and some other types of optics that we'll see later. And the same for the y coordinate. So we can render this. So as you can see, x focuses on the first coordinate of the point, as we would expect. And y focuses on the second part. So now we have read and write access to parts of the point, which basically means that we can create a point interpolator by interpolating those parts in separate. So what we can do is point interpolator is we'll interpolate x with our double interpolation. And we'll interpolate y with the same thing. So now we can sample points. So we can say uh, point i sample from point, let's say, 20, 10 and 20 to point 20 and 30. And we want five points. I think I'm missing a parenthesis. Right, so we had our initial point here. We had our destination point here. And we have five samples. Great. Uh, well, next step is a polyline. Polyline is basically a sequence of points. And I have a couple of polylines here. So each of them have two points. Uh, the intuition here is that if you have two polylines with the same number of points, you can just interpolate them point by point. And we can basically use the same approach. So we'll just say polyline interpolation is uh, so we get access to the points filled with lens. And then we just say interpolate each of them with. Uh, and I know I already defined point i, but actually ref3 already provides that out of box, so I'll just use that. So in the same way, we can just render uh, those polylines. Uh, so if we sample from polyline 1 to polyline 2 with two of them, well, actually 2 is boring. It's just the same 2. <coughs> So we started with two polylines, and now we can interpolate and insert two polylines in between. Uh, so this is great, but I think it's time for us to do actually some serious interpolator. And what we are going to do is to interpolate a single edge in the graph. Uh, so it should be something like this. And the expected result is this. So if we have an edge that moves from the left to right, we want to smoothly interpolate that edge. Uh, well, for that, actually, we need to understand how those edges are actually represented, right? So I have an edge here, which I took from a real graph. And it's uh, just a bunch of XML, which we can render here. So it's an SVG element that has a path element here. And the path element has a, has a D attribute which is actually an SVG path description, which is uh, super obscure. But it just has commands like move to, or line to, or curve to. And with this, uh, it defines the path. And if we want to animate this thing, uh, we want to animate this particular thing with the path specification, right? So the first step for us to get there would be to get to the path element. And this is, again, one time where optics really help us. So I already have some optics defined for going inside XML and getting arbitrary nodes there. So let's start with the path, which is an optics um, collect first. And here I have this small um, CSS-like selector syntax. So we are just going to collect the first element of type path. Uh, right, so if we render this guy, 
and point it to the edge, it will focus on this path. Right, so now we want to get from the path to this D attribute. And one of the nice things about lenses or other types of optics is that they compose. So if you have an optic from A to B and an optic from B to C, you can actually get an optic from A to C. So if we had an optic that goes from an XM, yeah. Um, so optic, collect optic collect first is from ref tree. Actually, everything here is from ref tree. Okay. Uh, but that's a great question because it's not very clear how to write such an optic that goes into XML and provides a read-write access to a part inside it, right? And we'll get back to it in the in the last part of the talk. Um, so, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, as much as I would like this to feel like magic to you, <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to explain. So basically it transfers to a file called diagram.png and this is a simple image viewer that just points to that file. So every time you override it, it displays a new one. Um, <coughs> maybe for, for the next version, I would like to explore porting this to Scala.js so that you could just do everything in the browser and then you can even animate things and, uh, but for now, I'm just keeping it simple, um, right? So as I was saying, if we had a, an optic that go, that went from an element to an attribute, we could just use that, and luckily that exists. So we can just redefine our path as uh, what it was, and then we compose another optic, which is um, XML utter of D. So great, now it focuses here. But it's still a string, so we can't really do anything useful with it, right? And what we would really like to do is to parse it in some sort of case class, which actually gives us access to, to the semantic meaning of this string. Uh, and that also exists, so we can compose it with yet another optic. In this case, it's an isomorphism, so it maps from strings to a case class that I defined that is called path, which is just uh, um, an AST of this path. So it's called path, path string iso. And then if we render path, yeah, option of edge one, we can actually see this case class. So this is much easier to follow than a string. It has these uh, segments, which is a sequence of segments of a path. Um, and the first segment is a move operation. The second segment is a Bezier curve with two control points. And you can see that uh, the from element of the Bezier starts where we left off in the move to. So that's how the SVG paths really work. And the final piece of this, um, if we have this path, which is just a bunch of curves, we can actually approximate it with a polyline, right? If we sample it with a huge number of points, it will we'll get a polyline that really looks like that curve. Um, and I'm going to call it an isomorphism. I know it's not an isomorphism in a strict sense because it's kind of a lossy conversion, but if you put enough samples there, it's, it's almost there. Uh, so we are going to call this polyline. Um, it's actually a def. And we are going to leave it configurable. And it will be path compose iso path dot polyline iso of points. Uh, great. So now we can use this uh, to produce polylines from that SVG XML thing that we had. So, for example, if we say render uh, polyline of, let's start with two of them. Um, actually, I lied. First, we need to create an interpolation. So, interpolation is very simple. We already have a lens or some sort of optic that goes from XML to a polyline. So, now we just need to say interpolate with and put our polyline interpolation there. 
So we just say def edge interpolation um, with a configurable, configurable number of points, and this will be polyline of that number of points. Interpolate with um, polyline interpolation. Oops. Uh, points. Right. So just to recap, we went from interpolating a single number to interpolating a point that has two numbers inside, to interpolating a polyline that has a sequence of points inside. And then we went uh, from top to bottom. So we went from XML uh, to an element inside XML and then uh, an attribute of that element inside XML and then to a case class and then to a polyline. So now we finally can put all these pieces together uh, and we are going to take this interpolation for a ride. So we can say render frames from edge one to edge two. And here we say edge interpolation. Uh, let's start with four points and four frames. Oops, that's a bit too many. Interpolation, what did I call that thing? Edge interpolation. Yeah, that's not the easiest word to spell. <laughs> right, so we get something like this, and it's actually very crappy, as you would expect. So it just has four points, and it just has four frames. Um, so we can improve that a bit. We can start with 10 points and 10 frames. And this is already something, right? It's not bad. Uh, if we picked 100 points and 100 frames, it takes a bit of time to render. And I think this is the sort of thing that we are looking for. Uh, so an interested reader can extend this to support other aspects of the SVG. So we need to do this for all the nodes to move them around. Uh, we need to do this for the colors of the nodes, for line thickness, transparency, and there is quite a bit of other things that need to be animated. And Rev3 already defines all of that, so you can just go and look at the source code. Uh, it's actually pretty readable, so you can go there, SVG graph animation. Uh, so it just defines bunch of interpolations like fade out and fade in and interpolation of color, interpolation of thickness, interpolation of node position, edge position, uh, interpolation of sets of nodes and sets of edges, and finally an interpolation of SVG which interpolates everything. Uh, two things, so one thing it's pretty generic, it's somewhat tied to grasp, but it's very easy to redefine to just generally interpolate SVGs. So by using a lot of abstraction, we have something that we can use for other use cases or in other contexts. And another thing is that we never actually touched XML directly, which I'm sure for many people is a good thing. Uh, in fact, if we had the same set of lenses for some completely different format, we would just be able to use that. So again, that's the, the benefit of abstraction. Uh, now to the question of uh, how do you actually write lenses that go inside XML and modify things there? Because uh, the only way I know from the Scala standard library to, to modify XML, XML is to, to use this uh, XML transformer. How many people have used those? Did you like it? Uh, right. So. There is this data structure which is specifically made for modifying recursive data structures like XML or other types of trees. Uh, and it was introduced in a paper in 97 and it's called Zipper. Has anyone heard about Zippers? Some people, nice. Uh, well, I have here some simple XML uh, which looks a bit like this. So it's just a tree which starts with value one, and then it has some children that have values two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to write some more incantations. Question, yes. Well, it's it's kind of to make it more consistent with the with the other fields here, which are also dots. So in Raftery, you can define fields which have names or labels, like this one, and you can define fields without labels. And they use kind of the similar the same approach with this dot thing. Um, in the first version, I didn't even have the captions. It's actually a recent feature, so I didn't think much about it. But I think the uniformity makes sense. And as I said, uh, you can configure for your case class if you want to display field names, and if so, which ones. Um, right, so back to zippers. Uh, a zipper is something that provides you an access to a recursive data structure, and it focuses on a certain part of the data structure, and you can move the focus around. So you can go left, right, or up, or down. And when you're focused on a certain part, you can actually modify it, or you can insert things on the left or insert things on the right. Uh, so let's create the zipper. So this zipper points to the top of our XML. For now, it's nothing special. It's just created this object that has empty. It has four fields, so it's the focus. Uh, the left siblings of the focus, which is currently empty because it's the root of the tree. Um, it has the right siblings of the focus, which is also empty. And it has top, which points to the parent zipper, which there is none because, again, we are at the root of the tree. Uh, so now let's see, it. let's see what happens when we move down the zipper. And it will be a fair bit of noise, but bear with me. So we have our first zipper which is in blue, and it still points to the root of the tree. And now we have our green zipper, which is a zipper that we moved down left. So it points to this element, which is, has number two. So it's down left from the root of the tree. And it points to the parent zipper. Uh, I'm going to remove zipper because it just introduces a lot of noise. So this should be a bit simpler. Yeah. Um. Uh, you can call render with several things, and it will show all of them. And each of the things will be in its own color, which is also configurable. And since RAF3 actually tracks the IDs of the objects, it can identify which things point to the same instance, so it can show which things are shared. So remember that uh, RAF3 uses this uh, RAF3 uh, structure to visualize something. And there is a type class that is called toRef3, which defines how to convert your structure to that ref3 structure. Uh, and you can configure the instance of that type class. And for zipper, that instance says that you should highlight what the zipper focuses on. So highlight is one of the fields of ref3. You can highlight any um, node of the ref3. Right, so uh, as I said, you can use this to, to move around the XML. I have here something that is called zipper control. Uh, yeah. So it just binds, uh, just binds keys uh, WASD on movements on the zipper. So you can say move down, and it moves down. Then if you move to the right, the previous focus jumps to the left siblings. If you move right again, uh, again, the previous focus jumps to the left siblings and it picks the next right sibling and puts it at the focus. So you can just go left, right on this thing. Uh, if you go to this last element, uh, which also has some children, you can go down again. Uh, and now it just focuses on this number six and we have number seven on the right. So you can just go between them. And as you remember, top points to the parent zipper so that we can go back. And now is actually the crucial point because 
Uh, when we go up, what it's going to do is it's going to zip the current children on, on the current level. That's why it's called the zipper. And it's going to return to the parent zipper with the updated elements. So when we go up, well, we didn't modify anything, but I can show that as well. Uh, so let's say zipper move down left. Uh, So as I said, uh, we can insert things, and we can say, for example, insert left, uh, some fruit. And magically, this fruit appears on the left siblings. So it's a very straightforward data structure that allows you to go around and modify things. And again, an interested reader could implement all those op optics using this. So if you want to find an element inside XML and update it. You just have to create a zipper, go in some order. When you see the element, you get it. Or if you want to update, when you see the element, you put a new value there. And once you're done with, um, oops. Once you're done with updating the zipper, you can just say commit. And it goes all the way up, applies all the modifications and, uh, uh, Oh, it's a zipper control, never mind. Um, move down left, short left, fruit, uh, commit. So this way we can get the tree with our changes applied. Uh, another thing that is very cool about the zipper is that um, if you're doing some sort of interactive editing, you can keep track of a part of the tree that you're editing, or uh, you can store it in JSON or something like that. It can also be very useful. Uh, so this pretty much uh, concludes it. I don't know if you guys have any questions. Um, if there are no questions, I can also show some bonus materials. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was if I could tell more about the use cases of, of RAF3. Um, so RAF3 started as a project for supporting this sort of uh, live demos. So last year I was giving a talk on data structures um, and exploring how immutable data structures work and how they share parts of the structures when you update them. And that talk also included some explanations of lenses and zippers. And I found that it was really helpful to have this sort of visualization to instead of just writing code, people can actually see what is happening. Um, once I had that tool, I started employing it in other things. So for example, if you have a library like the zipper library that I am using here, which I wrote, uh, and you want to explain what a zipper is, you can just generate some of these pictures and put in the readme of the library, right? Um, another thing that actually someone suggested to me at Scala by the Bay this November um, is that you can use this for job interviews. <laughs> so if you have some sort of data structure question, like what, what is this data structure, you can just um, render it and show a picture and see if the person knows what it is or not. Uh, regarding this, I actually have this uh, bonus here. Uh, I can just leave it rolling. Um, this is a certain data structure um, where I elided the actual name of the data structure so you can try to guess what it is. And while it's rolling, I can take more questions. So I'm not sure if, if this fully answers, uh, but I think there are quite a few things you can use this for. Yep. Absolutely. So both zippers and lenses are functional concepts which allow you to edit something in an immutable way. So when you do all these operations on the zipper, it just returns a new zipper. So you're not really modifying anything. You're just applying modifications and getting a new thing back. And in the same way, uh, lenses are 
things that allow you to modify nested immutable structures, uh, like case classes, for example. So I don't know if you um, ever tried to use a copy method that Scala provides you, and you have like, uh, I don't know, a startup, and you have an employee inside, and if you want to modify something inside the employee, you'd say startup.copy, employee calls startup.employee. So it, it, gets, um, um, it gets very bad very fast. So by using lenses, you can actually do this very quickly. And um, Adam is here. He actually implemented a library called QuickLens, uh, which allows you to do that sort of thing uh, without creating lenses. So I can show that. Uh, let's say you have this, um, well, I can close this. So let's, let's say you have this employee, which is a, a guy with the name and the salary. And you have a startup. Uh, so startup has a founder, and it has a team of employees. And the use case is basically you want to give everyone a raise, right? Um, well, in the mutable world, what you would do, you would write some sort of loop, and you would just go there and mutate things, right? Um, with lenses, you can construct the lenses to focus on all different parts of the startup, and, but it's, it's very boring because what you actually want to do is to give a raise. You, you need to, to dispatch this to the finance department. You don't want to spend time creating lenses. So what you can do is you can say startup, um, I think I need to import quick lens. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe I don't. Let's see. So startup. You can say modify all, and you can say founder and team each uh, using, actually, I want to modify the salary, right? Using whatever was there plus 100. Yeah, that's it. So this was very straightforward, I think. So. Lenses are really suited well for this sort of thing where you have case classes and they are probably different. So it's not the recursive data structure. You have a startup inside, you have an employee, which is a, a different type. Uh, zipper doesn't really work with that. It needs something. Uh, there are generic zippers that work with that, but the normal ones expect something uniform. So in XML, children of a node are also XML nodes. So this kind of supports this sort of navigation because it's all uniform, right? So you can. Uh, you can go back and forth on that. Uh, so zippers are more for recursive data structures, and lenses are for arbitrary things, and they can also be used as a nice abstraction like we did in animation, of just having a, a read-write access to a part of the data structure. It doesn't even have to be a field in the data structure. So for example, we had this um, XML edge, and we had a lens or some sort of optic from that XML to a case class which is not really a part of that XML, but we can still focus on it, modify it, and it modifies the original thing. Um, so the, just to sum up, lenses, I would say, used for abstraction and used for nested case classes. Zippers used for trees and for things that are uniform. And when you really want to, to do some recursive thing, because zipper can also support loops, so you can say, go down until you meet some condition. With lenses, it's kind of more complicated. And of course, you can use zippers to implement lenses, which apparently people are doing. I know that people do that for JSON also. Yep. Has there been any interest in using this in a debugger, like in IntelliJ or Eclipse? So Sorry. you'd actually be stepping through code and seeing the oh. data structure change? But sorry, your question is? Have, has there been any interest in implementing this in a debugger? Uh, I haven't thought about it, but I think it's a good idea. More questions? Uh, how much augmentation do you need in the SDK uh, that, that you have covered in uh, rest created by our Very little. The bare basics that are needed to do what I need needed to do. So I can show you I have um, uh, SVG optics. So I have a bunch of SVG optics here, a thing that gets a view box, 
a thing that gets a translation, which allows you to move things around. Opacity, color, um, path of a path element, points of a polygon element, and the position of text and some other stuff. And that's basically it. So it's surprisingly minimal. Um, it was not really a goal to cover all SVG. The goal was to, to sort of get a principled approach that allows me to, to, trans to interpolate it with some sanity. Uh, because just going to XML and changing things there is not very simple to do. Uh, but actually, if I at some point move to Scala.js and I have actual ST for SVG there, uh, it would be easy to migrate because I already have all the lenses. I would just need to parameterize the types. Yep. Absolutely. So the question is if there are performance constraints. And um, if you try to render a collection with 1,000 items, especially if it's a fairly complicated one like a vector, um, well, 1,000 probably is okay, but 10,000, let's say, uh, the resulting image is gigantic. And you actually need a good image viewer to browse that because many image viewers crash <laughs> if you have that huge thing. Uh, for animations, it's even worse because it has several frames. And if you have um, a lot of interpolation frames, like let's say 100 frames between each two keyframes, and you have something fairly complex uh, happening in the frame, it takes a bit of time to, to actually render. So I have some examples here that take maybe five minutes to render on my machine. And it consumes about six gigabytes of RAM, just to give you an idea. So obviously, it's probably not a good idea to visualize something very huge. But at the same time, you probably don't want to be looking at something huge. Well, I suppose if you render into SVG and then you have some sort of common line tool that, or some sort of tool that allows you to just render a part of SVG, that would be possible. Or you can render through PNG. I'm not sure if there is something that allows to render just a part of PNG, but that should also be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, I know. This is the, the next step to translate it to Scala.js. Volunteers are welcome. <laughs> um, right. Uh, no one. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I could probably use the existing REPL like Scala ST, I think, uh, something like that. Um, and also, in instead of uh, just jumping when you switch from one to into another, from one picture to another, I can use the same animation concept. So it would just smoothly animate. I'm not sure how long it would take to render that in a browser, um, but hopefully fast enough. Yeah. It does not support circular references, no. So um, this is targeted towards uh, immutable data structures where a circular reference is very unlikely. Uh, anyone wants to guess what this is? Sorry? Nope. This is actually a pretty cool data structure that is called uh, finger tree. There is a paper on it which is very enlightening. Um, 
in the um, in the Scala Day schedule, you have the link to the demo page. It has a full transcript of this talk and also of the previous talk, which I really recommend. Um, and the previous talk also has some bonus materials and links to papers and stuff if you want to read about this sort of data structures like the zipper or the finger tree or lenses or whatever. So that's it. Thank you. <laughs>